Hi, I'm John, the Interest-Free Banking Systems Engineer, Termel, and this is part two of an article by Ms. Ellen Brown saying how cash-starved states can create their own credit and attempt to get Governor Musclebrain Schwarzenegger to understand that even if he's too silly to do like the provincial governors in Argentina who paid their employees with small denomination bonds rather than lay them all off, she's suggesting that he pay them with a new Bank of California like the Bank of Nova North Dakota does with its employees. Good idea. A license to create money. <clears throat> Under the fractional reserve lending system, banks are allowed to extend credit, create money as loans, in a sum equal to many times their deposit base. Congressman Jerry Voorhis, writing in 1973, explained it like this. Well, first of all, that's wrong. Quote, for every dollar or dollar fifty which people or the government deposit in a bank, the bank system can create out of thin air and by the stroke of a pen some $10 of checkbook money or demand deposits. It can lend all that $10 into circulation at interest just so long as it has $1 or a little more in reserve to back it up. So if they got a $1 deposit and they're going to pay the depositor his 10%, they get to lend out ten dollars and charge fifteen percent on the ten to make a buck fifty. So they pay the depositor his ten cents and they make the other buck forty. Not how it works. We'll call this the Voorhis error, where they think that the one dollar they borrow and pay interest on to the saver allows them to lend out ten times and collect ten times the interest. False. So that banks actually create money with accounting entries was confirmed in a revealing booklet published by the Chicago Federal Reserve titled Money Mechanics, Modern Money Mechanics. The booklet was periodically revised until 1992 when it had reached 50 pages long. On page 49 of the 1992 edition it states, with a uniform 10% reserve requirement, a $1 increase in reserves would support ten dollars of additional transaction accounts loans created as deposits in borrowers accounts now notice they said reserves not deposits so there's a difference reserves are what they call brand new money issued by the fed out of their tap then that money gets rolled over and multiplied ten times as much through all of the chartered banks but not lending out straight 10 times the amount for a deposit. So that's the Voorhis mistake. The 10% reserve requirement is now largely obsolete. In Canada, we don't have a reserve. In part because banks have figured out how to get around it with such devices as overnight sweeps. What chiefly limits bank lending today is the 8% capital requirement imposed by the Bank of International Settlements, the head of the private global central banking system in Basel, Switzerland. With an 8% capital requirement, the state with its own bank could fan its revenues into 12.5 times their face value in loans. True. 100 divided by 8, 12.5. Yes. And since the state would actually own the bank, it would not have to worry about shareholders or profits. It could lend to creditworthy borrowers at very low interest, perhaps limit only to a service charge covering its cost. Yes. Zero interest. Pure service charge. Smart little bit of interest causes a little bit of inflation. Remember, the Termel Miracle Equation. And it could lend to itself, or its to municipal governments, at as low as 0% interest. If these loans were rolled over indefinitely, the effect would be the same as creating new debt-free money. Not debt-free, interest-free. they got to pay it back. So dangerously inflationary? Not if the money were used to create new goods and services. Price inflation results only when demand, money, exceeds supply, goods and services. When they increase together, prices remain stable. So Ms. Brown knows about shift A inflation, an increase in the money chasing the goods, but she doesn't know about shift B inflation. The opposite. Figure it out. So, today we are in a dangerous 
infl deflationary spiral as lending has dried up and asset values have plummeted. The monopoly on the creation of money and credit by private banking fraternity has resulted in a malfunctioning credit system and monetary collapse. Credit markets have been frozen by the wildly speculative derivative gambles of a few big Wall Street banks. Bets that not only destroyed those banks' balance sheets, but are infecting the whole private banking system with toxic debris. To get out of this dis deflationary debt trap requires an injection of new debt-free money, interest-free money. You can't have debt-free money. Well, you could, but you're not supposed to. Into the economy, something that can best be done through a system of public banks dedicated to serving public interest, administrating credit as a public utility. Yes. Some experts insist that we must tighten our belts and start saving again in order to rebuild the capital necessary for functioning markets, those who think banks are piggy banks. But our markets actually function quite well so long as the credit system was working. We have the same real assets, raw materials, oil, technical knowledge, productive capacity, labor force, etc., that we had before the crisis began. Our workers and factories are sitting idle because the private credit system has failed. A system of public credit could put them back to work again. The notion that money is something that has to be saved before it can be borrowed, those who think it's piggy bank, misconstrues the nature of money and credit. Credit is merely a legal agreement, a monetization of future proceeds, a promise to pay later for the fruits of the events. Banks have created credit on their books for hundreds of years, thousands actually, and this system would have worked quite well had it not been for the enormous tribute siphoned off to private coffers in the form of interest. Yes, a pure credit system with no interest, poker chips, is a perfect model. A public banking system could overcome that problem by returning the interest to the public purse or not having any interest. This is the sort of banking that was pioneered in the colony of Pennsylvania where it worked brilliantly well. This is probably colonial times. Restoring Michigan to solvency. Among other advantages to a state owning its own bank are the substantial sums it could save in interest. As Fleetham notes in his own ailing state of Michigan, according to recent financial reports available online, <clears throat> the state of Michigan, the city of Detroit, and the Detroit Water and Sewage Department, the Wayne County Airport, the Detroit Public Schools, University of Michigan, Michigan, Michigan State University pay over $800 million a year in interest on long-term debt. If you add interest paid by Michigan cities, school districts, and public utilities, the cost of taxpayers easily tops a billion a year. What does Wall Street do with our billion dollars annually? They decorate their offices like kings. Interestingly, she continues, the projected state budget deficit, no, he continues, uh, for 2009 is also a billion. If Michigan did not have to pay over a billion in interest to Wall Street, the budget could be balanced and the state could be restored to solvency. And that's what I always said. It's only the interest that causes the imbalance. A state-owned bank could not only provide interest-free credit for the state, but could actually generate revenues for it. Fleetham notes that in 2007, the bank in North Dakota earned a net profit of $51 million on a loan volume of $2 billion. He comments, Last year, Michigan citizens paid over $5 billion in personal income tax. With a state bank like North Dakota's, we could reduce this burden, fund new businesses, and restore our crumbling water and sewer systems. And we don't have to feel sorry about Wall Street losing out business. They didn't earn the money they lent us. They created it in computers and charged us interest to boot. Let's follow North Dakota's lead and get free from Wall Street's web. Taking the initiative in California. California could do this as well. Robert Ellis is a Tucson talk show host who once worked on Wall Street and has been involved in setting up several banks and financial institutions. In January of this year, he proposed in a letter to Governor Schwarzenegger that California could resolve its financial woes by setting up a bank on the model of the Bank of North Dakota. And I guess Governor Musselbrain didn't catch on. Ellis wrote to the governor, quote, I admire your tenacity in dealing with California's financial problems. Your idea of using IOUs was ingenious. A, hey, only ingenious if you accept some back in taxes. Otherwise, it's not ingenious. Pretty stupid. But there is a better way. 
The state of California can charter its own bank and issue its own checks to all state employees, almost like its own bonds, right? This, it can also pay all its vendors, contracts, and contractors through the bank. Yes. Additionally, once the bank is operational, you can fund your own state projects and you determine the interest rate paid, could be zero, as opposed to being at the mercy of the banks you currently deal with or the interest rates the investment bankers make you pay to issue bonds when you could issue 0% bonds. By doing this, you will put the state in control of its own destiny and make it the benefactor of its own money. And Governor Musselbrain didn't do it yet. Quote, what am I proposing is not new. Ah, stop.